young ones who say, uh, as your, uh, what is your name? Anu. Uh, referred to it as a very emotional welcome. Uh, indeed, they did okay. Uh, I want to ask you if it's all right for me to speak in English. I'm more comfortable. But if you want me to speak in Hindi, I will make an effort. So, is everyone comfortable with my speaking in English? Sure? Okay. All right, let me uh, at least as a mark of respect for all of you present here, start by speaking a few words in Hindi. And then when I begin to talk about the law, I will uh, switch to English. So, first of all, Khatija Madam said that I have been called for this, that I will tell you about my journey. What is in my journey? What is in my journey? How is it in my journey? और एक तरह का उनकी उम्मीद थी कि आपके सामने एक तरह का मैं इंस्पिरेशन रख पाऊंगी लेकिन अगर मैं आपके सामने सच बोलूं तो ये कहना पड़ेगा कि मेरा मन बहुत दुखी है और आज के दिन जब हम न्यूज़पेपर खोलते हैं तो हम पढ़ते क्या हैं जो लड़की को उनाव में रेप किया गया था वो गुजर गई उसको 90 परसेंट बर्न्स इंजरीज उसके अपने रेपर्स ने बर्न किया जला दिया हैदराबाद में क्या हुआ आप सब जानते हो उत्तर प्रदेश में एक लॉ स्कूल की लड़की एक दो महीने से जेल में है जिसने एलिगेशन लगाया था कि मेरे खिलाफ वाइस चांसलर ने रेप की है तो आप अगर मेरे से सच पूछोगे तो मैं आपको क्या इंस्पिरेशन दू और किस खुशी के मौके में मैं यहां आ सकती हूं मैं नहीं समझ पाई तो मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि हमारे देश में हमारे लीगल सिस्टम ने हमसे धोखा दिया है लेकिन इस धोखे के लिए दोषी मैं सिर्फ लीगल सिस्टम को नहीं ठहराऊंगी क्योंकि आप और हम सब इस सिस्टम में शामिल हैं खास करके वकील खास करके लॉ स्टूडेंट्स हम और एक जुडिशियल सिस्टम के हिस्से हैं तो जब आपने इस तरह का टॉपिक चूज किया है कि जुडिशियल एक्टिविज्म रोल ऑफ द जुडिशरी इन ट्रांसफॉर्मिंग द कंट्री फॉर वीमेन आपको अपने आप को भी इस सिस्टम में जोड़ना पड़ेगा आपको अपने रोल को भी समझना पड़ेगा आपको ये भी समझना पड़ेगा कि देर कैन बी नो जुडिशरी विदाउट Lawyering. Does everybody understand this very clearly? Up spash root se ye samaj ne ki zarurat hai. Ke agar lawyer nahi ho, agar lawyers nahi hai, to judiciary ka kya matlab hota hai? Kuch nahi, zero. Har mukadame me do parties hote hai. और दोनों के अपने अपने वकील होते हैं मैं आज थोड़ा सा क्रिमिनल लॉ पे एक्सरसाइज करना चाहूंगी क्योंकि क्रिमिनल लॉ कैन एंड डज लीड टू लॉस ऑफ लाइफ एंड लिबर्टी आखिर क्रिमिनल लॉ का मतलब क्या होता है क्रिमिनल लॉ का मतलब होता है those who are found to be guilty by a competent court of law will be deprived of their life and liberty. Now, what is our constitution? What is our heart? What is our constitution? We have to understand the most important thing in the right to life and personal liberty. 
बाकी जितने भी प्रोविजन है कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन के इसी एक लाइफ एंड लिबर्टी के लिए ही बनाए गए हैं है कि नहीं आप मानोगे ये बात तो कहने का मतलब है कि कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन हमारा बना किस लिए क्यों बना कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन बना रूल ऑफ लॉ के लिए कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन बना राइट टू लाइफ के लिए कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन बना आप और मेरे लिए तो आपको ये जानना पड़ेगा कि एक व्यक्ति के लिए एक व्यक्ति के लिए कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन बना है लेकिन एवरी इंडिविजुअल काउंट्स फॉर वन प्लीज डोंट फॉरगेट दैट एंड एवरी इंडिविजुअल इन दिस कंट्री इज ऑफ इक्वल वर्थ डब्ल्यू ओ आर टी एच इक्वल वर्क खतीजा मैडम है तो इसको आप हिंदी में समझा दिए प्लीज Every individual is of equal worth. मतलब आपकी और मेरी तुलना एक ही है चाहे अमीर हो चाहे गरीब हो कोई भी क्यों ना हो इक्वालिटी का मतलब क्या होता है इक्वालिटी का मतलब होता है नॉन डिस्क्रिमिनेशन अब मैं आपको हमारे आर्टिकल 14, आर्टिकल 15, आर्टिकल 16 का आप सोचिए कि इन आर्टिकल्स का आपके जीवन में क्या मतलब है देखिए आप लॉ स्कूल में जाते हो आप पढ़ते हो आपके हाथ में कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन भी है आप रोज कोर्ट में जाके बहस भी करते हो आर्टिकल 14, आर्टिकल 15, आर्टिकल 16। लेकिन मैं यहाँ आपको ये बोलना चाहती हूँ कि आप सोचो कि आपके अपने जीवन में आर्टिकल 14 का मतलब क्या है आपके अपने जीवन में आर्टिकल 15 का मतलब क्या है आपके अपने जीवन में आर्टिकल 16 का मतलब क्या है और आपके अपने जीवन में आर्टिकल 21 का मतलब है क्या तब आप कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन समझ पाओगे नहीं तो आप कितना भी पढ़ो अपने लॉ स्कूल में जब तक आप ये नहीं समझते कि ये कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन बना है हम सबके लिए आपके लिए और मेरे लिए तब तक आप कभी वकील नहीं बन पाओगे इतना सोच लो आपके हाथ में डिग्री मिल जाएगी आपको कोर्ट में जाने का बहस करने का मौका भी मिल जाएगा लाइसेंस मिल जाएगा लेकिन आप कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन नहीं समझ पाओगे इसलिए आप अपनी जर्नी कानून में और एक वकील के नाते होने से यहां से शुरू करो अब यहां से शुरू करो अब अगर आपको ये सहानुभूति है कि जो एस्पिरेशन मेरे हैं वो उसके भी हैं उसके भी हैं तो आप जरूर एक अच्छे वकील बनोगे लेकिन जब तक लॉ हैज टू अ लॉयर प्री कंडीशन फॉर बींग अ लॉयर हैज टू बी दैट यू मस्ट हैव कंपैशन For your fellow human beings, वरना आप वकील क्यों बनते हो आ, आप कुछ बिजनेस भी कर सकते हो आपकी वकालत का मतलब है एक तरह की आप सेवा कर रहे हो आप लोगों की सेवा कर रहे हो और ये आपका इसमें कोई जजमेंट नहीं आता है कि ये इंसान गिलती है या नहीं गिलती है आप का रोल है कानून के हिसाब से आपके क्लाइंट को आप सर्विस दो लेकिन आपका जो रिसेंटली हु वॉज इट हु हाँ जस्टिस रोहिंदन नरवन ने अपने जजमेंट में लिखा है शबरीमला के केस में उन्होंने लिखा कि हम वकीलों का बाइबल कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन ऑफ इंडिया है आप शायद ये भी जानते होंगे कि आज के माहौल में इस कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन के ऊपर बहुत अटैक हो रही है आप देख रहे हो आप देख रहे हो कि आज के कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन पे कितनी अटैक्स हो रही है हाँ या ना किस तरह की अटैक्स कोई बता सकेगा मुझे आप सब कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनलिस्ट हो आप सब वकील हो आप सब लॉ स्टूडेंट्स हो 
आप मुझे बताइए कि आज के जमाने में किस तरह की हत्या हो रही है कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन में अभी अभी आपने इतने छोटे छोटे बच्चों से क्या सुना क्या सुना बच्चों से आप मुझे बताइए कि आप डेली न्यूज पेपर्स पढ़ते हो आप डेली पार्लियामेंट को देखते हो आप डेली टेलीविजन देखते हो आपकी राय क्या है हमारे कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन में किस तरह का अत्याचार हो रहा है एनीबडी या एग्जाम्पल ऑफ वॉट इज गोइंग ऑन इन पार्लियामेंट टूडे एंड टेलस whether you consider this an assault on the constitution yes the gentleman over there what times you are you are living in you are young you are entering the profession two major challenges right on the table in front of you one a challenge of protecting the secular values of the constitution and the other a challenge on protecting the rule of law these two challenges together cover the whole field of what you need to know and the third one is the one which i presented to you discrimination based on sex race religion caste or any one of these so now you have yourself i don't have to deliver a lecture here you yourself have identified what is the meaning of constitutionalism constitutionalism means the defense of secularism it means the defense of the right to life in accordance with the rule of law and it means no discrimination based on sex race caste religion or any one of them these three fundamentals are like your bible this is what you need to know to be good lawyers and if katija were to ask me the question how did you become the lawyer you are she asked that question when she was introducing me i have become the lawyer i am by swearing by these three principles and i would say that yes uh, as a woman as a woman lawyer i have been discriminated against i would say i'm still discriminated against but the whole joy of life is to fight against that discrimination and whether you succeed or don't succeed is not something that i'm going to place before you but it's that is the journey that is the journey that she talked about it is the journey towards gender justice and it's a never ending journey that's why i started by saying if you can have a bunau reflecting die and die if you can have a law student in prison if you can have a woman in hyderabad killed and if today a large number of people consider justice to be shoot and kill at point blank we do not shoot people who are accused of crime for us that is not justice much as we condemn rapists for the heinous crime they have committed we don't think justice is to kill them at point blank remember if today a rapist can be killed at point blank and it's acceptable tomorrow you and i can also be killed look at it very personally why why what is to stop people from killing us at point blank nothing i would like to quickly move to another point which is also the heart of the constitution and which this is something i would like all of you to remember throughout your young lives and throughout your adult years and that is the right to freedom of speech and expression so why am i here today able to talk to you about things that matter to me because i enjoy under this constitution the right to freedom of speech and expression 
There are countries in the world which do not enjoy this right. There are constitutions in the world which don't guarantee this right. But what you have to remember is that you are living in a country which does guarantee the right to freedom of speech and expression. That is why Khadija can do the work she does in alternative space. That is why HRN can do the work they do. That is why I at the Lawyers Collective can do the work that I do. Because we enjoy the right to freedom of speech and expression and because we enjoy the right to associate with each other. That we just all constitutional rights, all Article 19. So once again I will tell you when you are debating and discussing these issues, please learn how to bring these rights in your day-to-day -day life. How do you make them real? How do you make these rights happen for you? Not by just reading it in a book. You make them happen for you through your struggle, through your journey with your feet. And by living these rights. So let me just say a few more words about the right to freedom of speech and expression and once again throw the floor open to you. How many of you think that the right to speech, the freedom of speech and expression is under attack today? Oh, wonderful. So many hands have gone up. Okay, wonderful. Let's have any one answer. And why? What is the nature of the attack? So many hands have gone up, Khadija. Yeah, yeah. Any one of you? how the right to freedom of speech and expression is under attack. <coughs> a small example of it is like how sedition, cases of seditions are being filed uh, randomly by people. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, there is terms like urban naxal and anti-national used for those people who like you question a bill that is being uh, uh, presented before the parliament and you are labelled as an anti uh, Indian anti-national and an urban Naxal. This is clearly an attack of freedom of speech and expression. Good, very good, excellent. And Khadija, I don't think you need to have called me here today. All your uh, students are so well trained and so well up to the mark. So. I don't know what is the purpose of your calling me here then any one of them could have delivered this lecture. Anyway, so absolutely and uh, as I saw, one of the most recent examples of that was a professor from Arigat Muslim University against whom a case for sedition was filed for having questioned the manner in which Article 370 was introduced into India. So come back to the whole right to freedom of speech and expression. Uh, the, the price that a lot of people have paid for freedom of speech and expression has been sedition and sometimes even beyond sedition. So at this point I would like to say a few words about my own personal experience. I have paid the price for freedom of speech and expression by having to face the CBI FIR against me and against Mr. Grover and against the Lawyers Collective for ostensibly having violated FCRA. But if you, and this is a very important point for all of you lawyers to remember. If you go back into my history, Khadija asked me for my journey. If you go back into my history, you go back into your, my journey, you will find that many of the cases that I took to court were cases precisely demanding accountability from powerful people. Demanding accountability in the Sorabuddin case, which was no different from what happened to these four rape accused who got killed, okay? I don't see any difference today. The nation is outraged. Uh, that, uh, that, that, yes, the, the Andhra Pradesh High Court has entertained a petition 
on the killing of these four excused and called for an explanation of what has come to be known as an encounter death. So Ravadin's death was also an encounter death. So it, my journey has included arguing cases like this. And what I would like to say before moving on with my presentation is that today we are witnessing more and more lawyers under attack for doing their professional duty. You have a Sudha Bhardwaj who is sitting in prison for more than one year. You have a Suratha Gatling who is sitting in prison for more than one year. You have an Indira Jai Singh and an Anand Grodha Brahma who are facing an FIR. You have a lawyer from Chandigarh who represented Sudha Bhardwaj who is also facing an attack. And so what you're seeing is a pattern, a pattern of the attack on the right to legal representation. It's the same old story. I mean, if you kill the messenger, uh, the problem will disappear. Who are we? Who are we lawyers? I started by telling you that lawyers are part of the judicial system. I started by telling you that you can have no legal system without lawyers and that's why I hope all of you are becoming lawyers. I hope all of you are training to be lawyers because there is no judicial system without a legal profession. Remember that you're living in an adversarial system. You're, you're living in a system in which your right to legal representation is guaranteed as a fundamental right. You're living in a system in which the barrier between you and the state is the lawyer. I'm very fond of saying this, that if any government wants to approach the judiciary, they have to go over the heads of the lawyers. They can't make a direct approach. <coughs> So there are ways of dealing with this. If you just eliminate the lawyer from the scene, you go straight to the government and you go straight to the judiciary and do what you want to do. So this brings me to the issue of judicial activism and the mechanism of PIL through which in this country judicial activism has been developed. All of you have studied in law school what is the meaning of PIL. I hope all of you know the meaning of PIL, but once I must tell you something very amusing. There was a time when I asked a lawyer, what, what does PIL mean? He said, Madam, you have to a son, Saman, a pill, I said, pill. I've just said, pill, let them hope, I said, pill. This is the kind of answers that I have received from uh, people who are aspiring to become lawyers. That means they don't know the history of how that PIL bill stands for public interest litigation. They don't even know that. They think it's a bill which you take and all your problems are magically solved. So I'm sure that in a prestigious law school like this, you are introduced to the origins of public interest litigation, which is the main tool through which judges are supposed to be activists. I will just say a couple of sentences about judicial activism. See, judicial activism is the heart and soul of the judicial process. And I really don't think it should be called judicial activism. It should be called judicial interpretation. The reason is that under the constitutional scheme, it is the judges who interpret the constitution and tell you what it is. Now you have like one sentence in the constitution which says no person shall be deprived of life or liberty except by procedure established by law. But what does life mean? What does procedure mean? What does liberty mean? These are things which are spelled out by the judges through the process of judicial interpretation. 
Yes, the scope for judicial interpretation is extremely large when it comes to the Supreme Court and the High Court. It may not be quite as large when it comes to district courts and trial courts. I use my word carefully, may not be, but it still can be. It is, in fact, so don't think that judicial activism begins and ends with the Supreme Court and the High Court. It does have a trickle-down effect on district courts and trial courts as well, because all laws are interpretation of words. All the entire judicial function is a function of interpreting the written word of the law. So even if you have a statutory law, it has to be interpreted. I give you one example, an example from which might come from the Domestic Violence Act. Now, you know the word shared household to the extent possible has been defined in the law. It simply says if two people or three people have lived or have lived together in a household, it becomes, a, in a relationship in the nature of marriage, it becomes a shared household. Now the judge has to interpret what is the meaning of in the nature of marriage. The statute can't spell it out. There, the judge has a choice to interpret it in a manner which will empower women or to interpret it in a manner which will not empower women. That is the judicial function. And what guidance will the judges use to decide how to interpret it? Again, you go back to the Constitution. Again, you go back to the directive principles of state policy. Again, you go back to the fundamental rights, the right to equality, the right to non-discrimination, the right to life and liberty, and the directive principles of state policy. Yes, the Indian constitution does have a very special place for women and for children. It has a special place also for scheduled castes. It has a special place also for minorities. And when I say special place, what I mean is, it recognizes the vulnerabilities of these communities which start life with a kind of a handicap, historically not having had all the advantages that an empowered community might have had. For example, in the case of women, it is patriarchy which has governed relations between men and women and which has governed legal relations between men and women. All of you know that there was a time when women didn't even have the right to vote. All of you know that there was a time when women could not even own property. So you can see the, the disadvantages position for where men and women are winning. The beginnings of a man is here, a woman is here, there's a lot of catching up to do before you can at least reach the level of equality. And it, that's why they say equality can always be among equals. So if you and I are not equal, now you think about it. So if you, you have to understand the concept of equality as being substantive equality also. Because you, you simply can't say that an Adivasi woman who doesn't have two square meals a day is equal to Indira Jai Singh, who has everything that she could possibly desire. At least in economic terms. So, how do you ensure that such a person is treated equally with the rest of us? And that's where the concept of affirmative action comes in under the Constitution of India, where you have Reservations for women, you have reservations for SCST, and as you all know, there is also a demand for reservation for minorities. It is rather unfortunate that the demand for reservation for minorities has been often rejected in the name that this would amount to reservation in the name of religion. I don't buy that argument because a minority is a minority at a disadvantage 
in relation to the majority. And as one speaker from the floor pointed out, today maybe the biggest threat to the Indian constitution comes on the issue of secularism. Secularism has a lot to do with the way in which minorities are tre treated. Somebody used the expression, the threats are coming from majoritarianism. So the fact is that we have a majority religious population in the country and a minority religious population in the country, more than one. So you can have attacks which are currently being visible in the country based on religion, based on a minority status, based on your other vulnerabilities, and there lies the role of a lawyer and the role of what you have described as an activist judiciary, but I would quite simply call it the judiciary, the role of the judiciary. You don't have to be activist to interpret the constitution in the way in which it is meant to be interpreted. All of you know, I mean, this is not like a classroom lecture, and that is why I will not take you through, uh, you know, like a compendium of cases, but all of you know the landmark cases of the Supreme Court of India, which have tried to interpret and put life and meaning into the fundamental rights. You are all aware of the Vishaka judgment, which led to the passing of the Sexual Harassment of the Workplace Act. I think many of you might be involved in trainings on the subject, so you know about it. I don't have the time to get into the details of the uh, imperfections of the Act. There are many that would require a very, very prolonged uh, articulation for which I do not have the time. But again, if you use the guidance which I have given you, that is, peg it on to a fundamental right, you would peg it on to the fundamental right to work for women. The right to work is not just the right to work, but the right to work is the right to work in a safe environment. Then you have cases like Lakshmi versus Jain of India, which deal with acid attacks. Yes, it's a severe case of violence against women, but please understand that violence against women is also carried out through an enabling environment. And what is that enabling environment? That enabling environment is, of course, the biggest enabling environment is patriarchy, about which we talk a little bit later on. But apart from patriarchy, you have the, the tools with which to be violent. You know, I mean, how many of you know that in the Nirbhai case, one of the enabling factors was the fact that the bus which had stopped at the bus stop was not licensed to ply at that time of night. It was a school bus, right? Now, the fact that an unlicensed vehicle could be plying late at night and passing itself off as public transport was also a big enabling factor for that incident to have occurred over there. The point that I would like to make at, at this point is that when your law enforcement machinery across the board is so slack, or it is ridden with corruption, there is going to be violence against vulnerable communities. And women are vulnerable. That is why in the Lakshmi case, the Supreme Court focused on what? They focused on licensing and regulating the sale of corrosive substances. And I have been told by my colleague that in the Hyderabad case, it was kerosene, which is freely available without any license that was used to douse and kill that woman. I don't know as yet what substance was used in that Punao case. Was it kerosene? Yeah. Okay. So, Khadija asked, Madam, what is your journey? But I'm sorry to say, Khadija, that the journey has been a very frightening one. 
when I first started talking about kerosene, or rather when the law first started talking about kerosene, it was in the matrimonial home. It was Satyarani Chadda, who is no more, but who can each other remember? Her daughter was killed to death by the use of a substance known as kerosene, poured over a woman in the matrimonial home, down to death. What did the police do? The police registered it as quote unquote an accidental death. And it was the mother of this girl, Satyarani Chadda, who stood up. Look, it took only one individual to stand up. Don't ever forget the power of one individual to change things. She stood up and she said, I refuse to accept the fact that this is an accidental death, quote unquote, accidental death. And until then, any number of women were dying inside the matrimonial home by the use of kerosene. And they were being registered as accidental deaths. But she stood up and she said, no, this is an act of murder. And I want it investigated with an FR under 302. And that is where the journey her journey and our journey, the journey of the women's movement began. But what I wanted to tell you is that from witnessing this kind of violence behind closed doors, we are today witnessing the same kind of violence on the streets of our cities. The pattern of violence is the same. The patriarchy is the same. The methods used are the same, but that violence has migrated from within the matrimonial home behind closed doors onto the public streets. This is logical. It's going to happen. A society which tolerates violence behind closed doors will witness violence on the streets. It will. And that is the significance and the importance of the Domestic Violence Act. It says no to violence behind closed doors. So please understand that the Domestic Violence Act is not a standalone isolated act. Learn to study and understand the Domestic Violence Act in a constitutional framework in a larger constitutional framework. Because if you believe that the Constitution of India does not permit violence against any human being and women, then you have to say, we cannot tolerate violence in the domestic home, and we cannot tolerate violence on us streets. Of course, the root cause of that violence is patriarchy. It is the vulnerabilities of communities which find themselves in a vulnerable position. It is the disbelief that society shows towards the story of the woman. A woman goes to a police station and says she's been raped by the police officer. Ah, two reactions. Either, okay, so what? Or, you know, you must be lying. Or, you must have asked for it. The letdown happens at that level. There's a letdown at many levels. She might have told her sister, and her sister might have said, keep quiet about it. It might have occurred from the father to the child, and the siblings could have said, the mother could have said, forget about it. So, these kind of letdowns are happening at many, many, many different rooms. A doctor could say that to a girl who goes to the clinic and says, okay, all right, I will treat you, but let's not talk about it. 
But what is the net result of it? The net result of it is that you have the Unao victim. It emboldens, emboldens the oppressors. And they think about it. The courage and the guts of a rape accused who's undergoing trial, who thinks, surely they thought they could get away with it. By doing to them, well, who is the primary witness in a rape case? The woman raped. But if you can get rid of the person who is raped, then where is the trial? There is no trial. That is the purpose of doing a rape victim to death. So, what I want to again and again emphasize to you is that the Constitution is not far from your door. The Constitution is not far from your life. It's at your doorstep. And as vulnerable communities, it's all that you have as your tool. Tell me, how many of you can pick up a gun and shoot? Can I see hands going up? Anyone in this audience who has a licensed gun? Nobody. Good. So what would you do? What would you do? Uh, the maximum I have seen women doing is saying, okay, we have the right to carry pepper spray with us as a means of self-defense. The other thing that I've repeatedly seen and uh, been told is part of public policy, the police, all right, all right, all right, we're going to train all women to do karate. It's fine, all these ways of self-defense, I would also encourage all these ways of self-defense but they're not the answer. The answer is surely the end of patriarchy and a functioning legal system in which we all do our jobs, whether we are lawyers or whether we are mothers, brothers, sisters, fathers, uncles, aunts, relatives, service providers or protection officers. Each one of us does the role assigned to us. It's a very, very critical point. We all have assigned roles or we have assumed an assigned role and we need to ensure that we deliver on our assigned roles. It's not as if the constitution of India is flawed. Of course, we could have a better constitution, no doubt about it. But if we try to work the constitution of India in the spirit in which it has been enacted, it will also be very helpful for us. There are rights and rights and there are schemes and schemes. You have the victim compensation scheme, which also came as a result of a court judgment, the Delhi domestic workers case. But then you go back to interpretation. You go back to interpretation. I read a recent news clipping about a judge who said, you know these rape victims, they are misusing the right to victim compensation. Now this is cool because, you know, it means I'm happy to get raped in order to get 50,000 rupees and go through a grueling trial. And I was a bit surprised to read that news report coming from a judge because one of his grievances was that even when the person is acquitted, compensation is still payable. But that is written into the law. The reason is that an acquittal doesn't necessarily mean that the rape did not take place. What it does mean is that we have not been able to prove that the rape took place. But the law takes this into consideration and says, well, such a person will also be compensated and the rates of compensation are fixed. And yet you have a judge saying that why are they being given compensation? There are cases and cases the Delhi High Court set up its own. How many of you have visited the vulnerable witness courts? How many of you in this room have visited vulnerable witness courts? And I don't know whether Ranchi has vulnerable witness courts, but have any of you visited Delhi? Have any of you? Yeah? Yeah, they just visited. So they are qualitatively different, 
And they also arose as a result of litigation going on in the Delhi High Court, just as Gita Mithil did set up vulnerable witnesses courts, which were meant mainly for child sexual abuse because the law recognized that you cannot treat a child witness in the same way in which you treat an adult witness. You cannot expect the child to be confronted with the accused. There are judgments which tell us that in rape cases you can't do what has come to be known as the two-finger two finger test, and yet they are being done. Now I'm going to quickly move to a few cases of great constitutional importance and conclude what I have to say. If you look at the last two or three years, there have been major judgments which have been rendered by the Supreme Court of India. You could begin by what has come to be known as the triple talaq case. You all know that the Supreme Court declared that triple talaq was unconstitutional. I would like to tell you that this case was a very, very challenging case. Very challenging case because in my opinion, it went to the root of what has come to be known as personal laws. In the Supreme Court, there is a feeling that personal laws are not subject to the Constitution of India. And personal laws govern marriage, divorce, custody, adoption, succession. Now think about it. Each one of these areas of law affects women very critically. And if you're going to say that this area of law is not governed by the Constitution, you are going to be, women are going to be in deep trouble. So, at the moment, I can only tell you that when this case was argued, I was arguing on behalf of some Muslim women. Others were arguing on behalf of other Muslim women. But there were parallel arguments on different lines. I argued it constitutionally, saying that personal laws are subject to the fundamental rights. Whereas others argue that triple talaq is un-Islamic and therefore it should not be recognized by court. Now both to different judges and there were different judgments but the conclusion was that triple talaq is unconstitutional. You must read the judgment to understand the differences in the approach. We move on to the Shabrimalai Temple case, a very, very important case for women. I will only tell you two factors. I argued the case on behalf of women. I argued it on behalf of an organization which calls itself Happy to Bleed. And it's an organization founded by a young girl who is not even a lawyer, Nikita Arora. You will see her interview on our website, which I will tell you about before I conclude. Uh, and she said, this is discrimination based on menstruation because it is only women between the age group of 10 to 15 who are not allowed to enter the temple. And seriously, in court, it was argued that this is not discrimination based on sex because women below 10 and women above 50 could enter. I have great difficulty in convincing the court that this is based on menstruation. And I thought I did not have to tell the court that menstruation is happening only to women and not to men. And therefore it's based on sex. But that was the ridiculous nature of the denial into which lawyers on the other side has fallen. It's also a case about the right to enter a place of worship and therefore based on Article 25. And this is the reason also that it is a very, very important case because it does amount to discrimination based on sex. I will just conclude by telling you about, well, you may know that the case has been sent for review and may go to a larger bench of judges. But the judgment has not been stayed. And so 
Bindu Adima, who is a scheduled caste woman, a lawyer, and a law teacher, was the first woman to enter the temple in the year 2018. And she made an effort to enter the temple again in 2019, on the 26th of November, which is Constitution Day, and she was stopped. So we have filed a petition in the Supreme Court on her behalf, saying that she was obstructed by state authorities, and therefore the court should direct the police and direct the state of Kerala to allow her to enter the temple. I am going to stop over here because I've said a lot. I think I have, whether I have inspired you or not, is not for me to say. These are not very inspiring times. I'm sorry, I should not say not very inspiring times. I said, I should say these are not very happy times. It's the time of struggle. But it is in the time of struggle that you can be your best. It is in the time of struggle that you can come into your own self. And it is a great time to be a lawyer because there are many challenges waiting for you as you come out of law school and many challenges as NGOs and as activists. Thank you.